welcome everyone to flying stories our today's guest is one of the most special minds his his name is often popped up in paragliding forums as people answering to every technical question posted not coming from a family where anyone is even remotely related to flying he started to learn flying sailplanes when he was 15 at age 22 he was re rewarded paragliding course as a payment to his work for a flying school like all of us he got fascinated by the simplicity of a paraglider and the freedom that comes with that he owned a noa paraglider back in his early flying days but little did he know that noa office is just 10 minutes away and would eventually become his creative playground in his journey he met a few interesting test pilots at noa and every now and then he kept doing some small part time job ranging from paraglider checks updating noa website testing on the wings gradually he got captivated by designing small aspects of the wing and went on to become the designer that he is today his journey is the perfect example if you have a hunger to learn and you are willing to put the work behind it you can become anything his first complete design was was an ena in3 and how the dots come and connect together his team would go on to keep the same aspect ratio of in in series and create a revolutionary high performance 99 cell paraglider Nova Phantom feeding to his technical curiosity he went on to show the world that if you have if you don't have any limitation what you can create is something exceptional Zayed Basil quoted his this design as a Rolls Royce with a 500 horsepower engine he has contributed designing the famous Ion series famous Mentor series revolutionary Nova Phantom and the Mile Eater Nova sector to walk us through a life cycle of how a paraglider is designed please help me in welcoming one of the most creative minds of paragliding industry the head of noa at noa research and development team philip medicus also known as pipo however guys the picture that you see is from a 11 year old pipo and you can already see the number of cells you know 11 <laughs> <the> year <laughs> old pipo already designed the noa phantom yeah all right pipo i now welcome you you can please uh, go ahead share some thoughts on how these things are designed hi thanks for the very nice introduction and uh, i was really surprised seeing this join <laughs> i don't know where you are. i don't know where you found it online yeah go ahead people yeah you can you can share your screen people right now One moment. Uh, yeah. There's some. Yeah. Okay. Here it is. Yeah. I wanna uh, talk about how a paraglider is created, and I wanna do this with the example of the IM6, mainly because it's Nova's latest creation. Uh. Yeah. I. the my presentation will be three parts approximately equally long and alok and me suggested to uh, let me finish each part and have questions after that so yeah i wanna tell you guys how the ion 6 or how a paraglider in general is being created the For the very first step is obviously to define um, what the new wing shall be capable of. And that's what we do as a team. Uh, we talk about the specifications we want from the new glider to um, define those specifications. We have a look at wings from other brands, obviously. and we also have a very close look in this case to the iron 5 collect all the feedback we get from pilots we get from schools uh see what they like see what they didn't like so much and from there we build a specification sheet the iron 6 was a quite new glider uh which does not have too much in common with the iron 5 so Mm -hmm. we start with something like a blank paper 
Uh, I will talk you through the different parameters which define a paraglider. The very first step is the number of cells. Uh, second step is the line layout. For a wing like the Ion 6, we want two things. We want the line layout to be simple. We don't want it to be difficult to sort the lines. And we obviously want to have a little line drag. And as a third thing, we want to make sure that each line is loaded equally. Then with every line set up, there comes a diagonal setup. You see here on each line, there are diagonals attached to it. Um, it's the same. We want to keep it light on the one hand, so we don't have, want to have too many diagonals. If we have too little diagonals, we're going to end up having too much lines. Now, finally, it looks a bit like a paraglider for those who haven't seen the paraglider before, uh, because I have added the curvature. The curvature is a very important aspect. It's the handling of the, it's very important for the handling of a paraglider. It's very important for the performance and for the stability. And it's very important for many maneuvers like deep spiral behavior, also collapse behavior. Uh, yeah, one of the most important aspect. Another very important aspect is the aspect ratio of a glider. Uh, for us, it's very important to keep the aspect ratio constant from wing generation to wing generation um, because it's sometimes tempting to increase the aspect ratio a little bit because it's a rather easy way to increase the performance. But in the long term, we don't think that it would be very clever because if we incrementally increased the aspect ratio from ion 2 to ion 3, from ion 3 to ion 4 and so on, we would end up with a very high aspect ratio and with a wing which would be too demanding to fly for the pilots we intend the ion to fly. Then, as you probably all know, the airfoil is very important for a paraglider, actually for every aircraft, but the airfoil for a paraglider is quite different from airfoils from other rigid aircraft. And the reason is that the, the, the lacking rigidity of a paraglider. The, so the airfoil of a paraglider has to keep the paraglider stable. That means the airfoil has to prevent deformations. And that's a demand which is not there for any other aircraft. Like a, a rigid wing aircraft doesn't have to take in account this kind of stability, which is very important for paragliders. That's why That's paragliding why airfoils, airfoils look airfoils. quite different. How do we come up with an airfoil? Uh, it's a lot of about experience. We have tried many, many things. Most of them haven't worked. Some have worked. But lots of simulation involved. We can simulate the performance of, uh, of different airfoils, and we can also simulate aspects like stability of the airfoil. Uh, but it's still a lot of it's still a lot about experience, and sometimes we try airfoils that perform well, but that end up being bad in terms of collapse behavior so a lot of a lot of experience is involved and like i said before it doesn't work the way it works for and we can't uh, we can't have a look at airfoils which exist for glider planes or for airplanes 
because it's yeah it's just something very different the airfoils which are used for a power glider as far as i know they can't be found on any other aircraft Um, after defining the airfoil uh, and all the things I already talked about, we've got a 3D paraglider with only one thing missing. You will probably see it. It's the ballooning that is missing. Uh, I will try to explain with a few slides what the ballooning is actually about. So the reason for the ballooning is the internal pressure the air flows into the intakes and the paraglider inflates basically like an air mattress uh, and the only thing that reduces the ballooning is are the wing tips like marked with those two arrows the wing tips pull the wing into a spanwise direction and they and that reduces the ballooning of the glider if we have a closer look at the wing things become a little bit more diffi difficult that's the center of the wing and you see the diagonals here. You see the, I'm sorry. So. Hmm. Do you prop, do you still properly see my presentation? I'm sorry for the interruption. Yes, yes, people. Everything's fine, thank you. Uh, so all those um, all those arrows show different forces which pull on the cells, and we have to to adjust the ballooning properly. We have to take in account all those forces. We have to take in account the lines pulling here. We have to take in account the diagonal ribs pulling here. And if you look very closely, you see that the ballooning on this center rib is a bit smaller than on this rib. The reason for that is that the diagonals pull stronger at this center rib. Here is another look at the paraglider. If you look closely at the front of the wing, you see that the surface is very smooth. Uh, that means that there is little ballooning. If you look a bit more behind, you see that there is more ballooning. And what you see on the right is the actual shape of the top sail, of the cloth which is sewn on the actual paraglider. And you see that in the front, where there is little ballooning, this pattern is quite narrow and it gets wider in the middle. And then again, narrow at the end. This means that where the surface is very smooth, there is a lot of tension on the paraglider, and where there's a lot of ballooning, there's little tension. The difficult thing is that it has to be adjusted very differently for every paraglider and even differently for each and every cell. So it's the uh, ballooning is one of the most complex aspects of a paraglider, but I, I would tend to say it's more important than the airfoil, for example. That's why I tried to explain the ballooning with a few slides. Now we have really got our paraglider ready. What my presentation until now was missing a bit were all those internal parts you see here. What you see here are different vector straps that increase the stability. What you see here are the holes inside the ribs, which are important to reduce weight, but which are also important to not place them at the 
wrong parts of the airfoil because otherwise uh, the stability will decrease. Um, after we made this 3D model, on the computer we start with one of the most interesting aspects of my work, with is, which is the simulation. The simulation we do of the paraglider consists of two parts. One part is the so-called CFD simulation. It's short for computational fluid dynamics, which can be imagined like a virtual wind tunnel. So the computer, basically the software, simulates how the air flows around the wing. Uh, it even simulates how the air flows inside the wing. That's what is showing here. Looks like some artwork, but it's actually taken out of a simulation. You will see here at the wing. Pardon. Uh, at the wing tip. At the wing tip, you see the vortices, and you see some air flowing outside the wing and into the intakes. So yeah, we can simulate quite well how the air behaves outside the wing and even how it behaves inside the wing, which is very important for the internal pressure. That is a so-called 2D simulation where we can look at very small details like the front of an airfoil or the opening. We use these 2D simulations to optimize the shape of the opening, so also to optimize, to do some basic airfoil research. Here you see the, the different colors represent uh, different pressures. That's the so-called stagnation point with a very high pressure, which increases the further away from that stagnation point you go. The problem with all those nice looking CFD simulations is that uh, the simulation is carried out with a rigid wing, which is not the case for paraglider, obviously. But inside the, this simulation, the paraglider can't be formed. It's basically like a paraglider made out of metal or stone. That's why it's very important for paragliders to have a different kind of simulation as well. And because, as all of you know, paragliders can deform, for example, they show small wrinkle. They show small wrinkles like it's visible here. And there is a simulation, the so-called structural in, uh, simulation, which can predict those kind of deformations very well. Uh, this kind of simulation knows the how the how different paragliding cloth behave. So we do measurements on the actual paragliding cloth and try to reproduce it as good as possible in the simulation. And we are getting better with it every year. Uh, and first we could simulate rather big deformations, not so well. And now we can also simulate quite small wrinkles, quite reliable. Here is another picture where you see that's a simulation of the ion 6, 6 at high speed. You see that's the intended shape and the actual shape on this virtual prototype looked something like this. So the, the, the pressure in the front leads to those wrinkles. Um, and the great thing about all those simulation tools is that we can 
run 100 different concepts in just a few days and so we uh, and there are many bad mo most of those 100 concepts are usually bad ones but the simulations allow us to find out very quickly that they are bad and not waste our time anymore with it without those simulation tools we would have to build those bad ideas and find out by flying those bad concepts which would take way more time and which would prevent us from progressing um, that's the end of this first part uh, if you want we can and if there are any questions it would be the time for questions now yeah uh, i think we have a question from andy first andy please go ahead unmute yourself if uh, let me see if you have yeah and you can unmute yourself and go ahead yeah thank you uh, hi i just want hi. to ask a question this, this might not be the correct one to design but uh, the, the dilemma that i face a lot of times is uh, uh, e and b gliders are coming in with low mid and high configurations by various manufacturers uh, the question that i want to ask is if i want to upgrade from a uh, to B, there are three three classes in front of me, and as a designer, or is, uh, as a designer, is there any specific difference between the design of all three of them? Like, why is high B preferred to downgrade from C, and why is low B preferred to upgrade from from A class? I mean, if you can just throw some light on this. Um, yeah, we 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 have a low B and a high B wing, and from the technical side, the main difference, uh, one main difference between those two concepts is the aspect ratio. And that I would say true for almost every high B and low B glider, that low B gliders have less aspect ratio, often a little bit less speed. And that makes them simply less demanding to fly. Uh, the, E and B range is quite big in terms of what is allowed or what is possible to certify with E and B. It's, it's a huge range. There are wings which are actually very close to a E and A glider, which are just on the edge of being E and B, or which are in the end end up being E and B. And on the other hand, there are wings with very high aspect ratio, which can also be certified with uh, EMB. And so to cover this huge range, it makes sense to split it for most manufacturers and have a low B and a high B wing. And it certainly makes sense to start to up if you, if you upgrade from E and A or if you to go for a low B wing because it's just it's just closer in terms of pilot skills needed basically. Uh, you're Can muted. You're so. Can you please repeat your question? You were muted. I'm saying the takeaway is to uh, upgrade to low B rather than focusing on getting to mid B or high B when you're when you're going up out from a school glider. Is, is that what I should try and uh, understand? Yeah, that's yeah, that that's, is certainly my that recommendation. Is certainly my recommendation. All right, perfect. Thank you, Vali. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. So I think the next question that we have is from. Rohan, Rohan, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so hi, Philip. Uh, uh, there's a question that there are so many technologies coming up in paragliding uh, in the gliders like uh, jet flaps, shark nose, raft, and uh, other various technologies. So what do you think, like, uh, because all the companies are going up with uh, more and more technological and uh, technical stuff. So which technology do you think is the most relevant and it's the best in nowadays in paragliding? Uh, the, the, the question was, which are the most relevant technologies? 
Yeah, actually, it's like uh, so th there are a lot of technologies to choose yes. from, and it has a lot of different technical aspects on the glider. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which technology do you think is the most uh, performative and uh, on the safer side also? And it is like a lot helpful for the pilots who are uh, in their mid of the flying career or like for different different flying careers. What te what technologies do you uh, suggest? Uh, it's a delicate question because, uh, and I don't, uh, I, I don't want to comment on all uh, technologies from uh, non-Nova gliders, but as a, as a rule of thumb, you will find many technologies which are only used by one single manufacturer manufacturer for ages and if this is the case um i would say that it's a hint that it's not the best or not the most important technology because i mean it's easier to name um, but i i don't want to name any of those technologies which i don't think are very valuable um, but if you think, for example, when diagonal rips were invented, it took a very short time until almost all paragliders had diagonal rips because they were just so beneficial. The same thing when nylon rods at the leading edge, not just at the leading edge anymore, were invented. It took a very short time for all other manufacturers to yeah, to, uh, to actually yeah to copy this idea and use yeah. it uh, so the general rule would be uh, the many that the technologies which are used by just one manufacturer uh, and are just promoted by one single manufacturer are usually not the ones uh, which I would go for, because if they were very, very good, all other manufacturers uh, will copy would yeah. them in their design. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. yeah. So it's. All Thank right. you. Yeah, uh, sorry. Thanks, thanks, Rohan, for the question. Uh, we have next question coming from Lakshman. Lakshman, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. My question is, uh, after you designing the glider, uh, how do you know ki which uh, type of uh, cloth you are using for those gliders and lines? Because after uh, design, that uh, software don't give us the, uh, which fabric we have to use and which line, uh, like uh, MM. He, so software give only uh, that length only, not to give that uh, 1.5 mm li line we are using for main, uh, 0 0.5 mm line for a topper cell. Uh, how can you decide for this uh, after you make a design? The, the sort of choice of material. Um, that to a large extent, that those are values from experience. Um, and for the choice of line materials, we use our check database a lot. All our all Nova gliders are checked uh, are checked with a, with the same tool, and all check results are accessible for us on a, a central server. So I, it's very easy for me, for example, to evaluate how the trim on certain glider has changed. I can have a look at many thousand gliders that have been changed. And for the Ion 6, for example, I had a look at all those thousands of checks that had been done with the Ion 4 and that had been done with the Ion 5. Uh, and I can evaluate that. I can and because of this very large number of checks, I can precisely see that a certain line material was maybe not so good because it tends to shrink 
or it tends to get longer. Uh, and in such a case, I try to avoid that for my, uh, for a next design. So uh, for the choice of the line materials, that's one important aspect to, because that's one of the most important aspect of lines is actually the length stability. You don't want the trim of the glider to change too much. And therefore you have to choose the right lines. Um, and we can also, our check database also contains the ripping strength of the lines. So when a check is performed, the checker rips certain lines and we can check the ripping strength. So if there is ever a line with critical ripping strength, it will, we will certainly find out because we have access to those thousands of ripped lines. Um, yeah, that's the, that's a big part of the approach for lines, but obviously uh, the line manufacturers produce new lines and some of them look very good and that's when we want to use them without having two or three generations of wings which already use them. So that's when we run internal tests. We run internal tests on prototypes and we also run some internal stretching tests, kinking tests, whatever. That's the approach for the line material. And for the, for the cloth material, the, it, we have a bit less data from our checks because the only test which is carried out is the porosity test. And so the, for the choice of the cloth, we rely more on our internal tests. Uh, what we do different kind of tests. We do UV tests. So we have different cloth and after a certain amount of uh, UV radiation, we test the porosity, we, test the, we, um, we check the ripping strength, we check the elasticity. Um, and we also do a so-called washing test. It maybe sounds stupid, but it turned out to work quite well. We actually put the cloth in a washing, washing machine without any washing soap. And we wash it and it turned out that uh, we get quite, th that this test correlates quite well with the reality in terms of if there are delaminations on the cloth. So that's a, that's a funny, funny little test we do with new cloth. And yeah, and then obviously for the cloth, it's the, if, if we want a very light glider, the cloth we choose from, the cloth range we choose from is very different than on heavier gliders. So, but to, to summarize, it's a lot about experience and it's a lot about tests. Okay, and second question is, uh, what is the role of uh, that uh, DXF file or CAD file? The, after, the you printing, after you uh, design the glider, the soft software, have you uh, removed that uh, one file that called a DXF or CAD file? Why they use for uh, that file? You use? I, I think I will, it's a, uh, yeah, exactly. It's a vector graphic file which contains all the patterns of the glider. Okay. Uh, and the, it's the, our design software which uh, creates those patterns. I will show, I will show this a screenshot from this uh, DXS file in one of the later slides. Okay. Uh, does that answer your question, Lakshman? We will, we will cover okay, that aspect okay. later. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, People, how are we? We still have the question queue, but if you want to go ahead with the session, we can go ahead or we can take a few more questions. Anything I, I don't mind taking two more questions. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, uh, Rohit, go ahead. You're next. Okay. 
Hi, people. Can you hear me? Perfectly, yeah. Oh, great. So the question that I have is, I think your answer was very spot on. Uh, the technology that catches up with all the manufacturers is often something to stay here for. Uh, so I have seen a reverse trend sometime. There was a time when all the manufacturers started adding a lot of reinforcement, long battens, the long nylon rods, uh, to stiffen the profile, having less attach points. But over the years, we started seeing some problems with that, especially in the large frontal collapses, there would be a bit more horseshoeing and so on, uh, cascades. And there are many manufacturers now focused on saying that, hey, we don't use a lot of battens in our design, only in the front area primarily. Uh, just curious, I mean, some guys say that it's a very easier way to get performance uh, without doing the hard work of fine tuning the internal optimum structure. Uh, just your your thoughts and comments on that subject. Um, I think um, if you want to maximize performance, if performance is the main constraint, those long rods, those long reinforcement rods are certainly the way to go. Because no matter, no matter how clever the design is, if you add those rods, you can have uh, airfoil with less thickness and that will always increase performance. So I would not say that it's a sign of bad design. Even if you, yeah, even if you have the perfect design, those uh, rods will enable you to have even more uh, performance. But as you said, uh, it has downsides. So if the constraint is not only about maximizing performance, but also about safety and obviously handling of the glider from packing to launching to storing, those downsides of the rods get more and more important. So I would say, I don't think that those rods will disappear on the competition wings right because performance be the king because it's about it's about performance it's so much about performance but yeah if it's if it's more about the other aspects yeah. certainly yeah great thanks thanks very much you're welcome Uh, hello, people. Do you hear me? Yep, perfect. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, I fly the Ion 3, uh, mm -hmm. the double axis model. And uh -huh. uh, the one interesting thing I read on Ion website on many Ion uh, pages is I, uh, Nova actually puts in uh, some considerable effort in redesigning the double axis models, smaller end of the design, to make sure that uh, the performance is up to the mark of, uh, of the entire uh, you know, range. Uh, say for example ion uh, range so uh, can you touch upon what is the standard practice and what nova does uh, especially to make sure that the smaller end of these gliders match up to the entire range thank you either the ion 3 was proposed first completely yeah different. yeah that's why i mentioned it high fly <laughs> thanks for that one so sure. um the most straightforward and the most easy approach is just scaling the whole glider. That means the, the, only dif the, the only difference is the size. But that leads to problems. There are quite many reasons why smaller paragliders uh, are a bit more difficult to design than bigger ones, at least in certain aspects. Um, one reason that's what's the most important reason for example if you uh if you imagine every paraglider has certain wrinkles because of the sewing process you can't you just can't avoid them and on a very large paraglider the wrinkle size is always the same and on a very large paragliders, those wrinkles with constant size do less harm 
than on the smaller paragliders where the wrinkles are relatively bigger. Uh, another reason is a very general aerodynamic rule related with the so-called Reynolds number. I, I won't go into detail, but what this rule uh, basically leads to is that big things simply fly better than small things. So if you, even without those wrinkle problems, if you have a, if you have a real sized glider plane, and if you scale that to the size of an RC plane, it will simply perform worse. That's a, that's a general aerodynamic rule and there is no way around it. Um, there are a cu couple, couple of more reasons why small gliders need to be different, treated a little bit different than big gliders. The uh, collapse behavior is a bit more difficult to handle. And so what we do or what we started doing over the years, we know which parameters we have to change to keep the uh, to keep the performance, the safety, and the handling on a high level. We cannot keep all three aspects on the same level as for the big sizes because there is this uh, aerodynamic rule we can't trick. Um, but we, for example, we have found out how we have to change the curvature, how we have to change the brake geometry uh, to make the small gliders work better than by just scaling them. In some cases, we even do uh, some adaptions to the airfoil because it, is, because it is needed and it makes sense. And last but not least, uh, to try to, to find out if all that actually works, you need a very light test pilot. And we have very light test pilots who can really fly the XS sizes and even the XXS sizes with a reasonably, reasonable load. So, uh, yeah, it's again a combination of design and also of testing. The, the, the tuning of the brake I mentioned, uh, that's something which is up to the test pilot. And also if you just, the, a small wing will always handle different than a big wing if you do nothing else but scale it. So yeah, in the end it's about the experience and the effort you put into, into these small sizes. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, next question is from Riz. Please go ahead. This is the last question that we will take for now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Perfectly. Yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, the first part is that uh, we were talking earlier about the fabric. Mm -hmm. uh, so is there, is there a difference uh, in the fabric in terms of performance, in terms of the life of the fabric? In, in, uh, in, if the color of the fabric is different? Um, is your question only related to the color or yes. also to oh, just <laughs> yes. Oh. yes. Different, different um, colors in the same fabric. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, for for some, fa there is no general correct answer to this question. For some, for some fabrics, there is a difference. Um, the reason for that is that uh, some very light. For some fabrics, some very bright colors like yellow or white have to undergo a bleaching process, which is not needed for the other colors. And so it's a different production process for very bright colors than for others on certain 
on certain cloth. So we had cloth materials where the white and maybe yellow colors were performing worse than the darker colors. Um, in this case, we just didn't offer them. But for most colors, according to our tests, there is no significant difference. Uh, maybe in, in theory, or, or not only in theory, also in practice, a, a very dark color obviously is easier heated up than a bright color, but we haven't seen an impact on the longevity in real life. So it seems to be more a theoretical thing. Uh, yeah, we we do uh, we do when we introduce a new cloth, we test the different colors we intend to use, and usually the difference is not significant. And if it is significant, we don't use the bad ones. Okay, yeah, I think you've answered the second part of my question also. Thank you. What was okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, let's stop the question queue for now, people. Uh, let's continue with the session and then we take the questions ahead. Sure. Okay. Thank you, people. Okay. Um, the last slide was about the simulation. And I would like to sum up what can be simulated. Uh, we can simulate the performance by which I mean the glide performance of a wing very well. We can simulate the speed we are going to achieve quite well. We can simulate the internal pressure in a glider. And to a certain extent, we can also simulate the stability the wing is going to have. And like I showed before, we can uh, more and more simulate almost all of the wrinkles, or most of the wrinkles, which are going to show up on the real paragliders. Then maybe more interesting, the things we cannot simulate yet are almost all maneuvers that ranges from a simple turn, which is induced by using the brake, uh, which is certainly something which is going to be part of the simulation in the future to collapses, which would be very difficult to simulate properly. We also do not simulate the behavior in turbulences because like I um, said before, this what we are doing is we put the wing in a virtual wind tunnel. And like in the real wind tunnel, this virtual wind tunnel does not have any turbulences. And uh, last but not least, the uh, paraglider is sewn by sewing machines, which are uh, operated by humans. And there is, and there are certain manufacturing imperfections, like the seam on the paraglider. And we do not simulate those unavoidable wrinkles you get by sewing. And also, we don't uh, simulate small sewing mistakes or things like that. So the simulation, the, the paraglider in the simulation is uh, just perfectly manufactured with it, which is not possible. Um, this, I already said, we can simulate 100 or more different concepts quite quickly. And uh, we do that until a stage where we think it's worth building the first prototype. Uh, on the left side, this was a question before about the, about the DXF files. So on the left side, you see the parts of one paraglider. Actually, it's the parts of one half of the paraglider but we only output one half as the paraglider is symmetric. So you see those are 
quite a lot of parts. You see the profile ribs with the holes here. You see the top sail patterns. You see the bottom sail patterns. You see the diagonals. Uh, and yeah, in actually the paraglide and ion consists of twice as much parts because that's just one half. On the right side, you see the so-called nesting. The nesting uh, shows how those patterns, in this case the profile ribs, are uh, arranged on the cloth before they are cut by the laser cutter. The reason for that is that we want to waste as little cloth as possible and there is an, use an optimization software that finds out how to perfectly place those patterns on the cloth. I'm gonna show three pictures of our production facility. This is the laser cutter. So there's in this case, I think it's there's uh, on this on, on this big table. Uh, the paraglider cloth is laying, and there is a very strong and very fast laser who cuts out all those many hundred parts. Then they are manually picked from that table and assembled. It's as you can see here, or as you can probably see here, those are quite many parts and it's quite difficult to sew that. So for that, there are easy parts to sew on a paraglider and there are difficult parts. And it takes a lot of experience and skill to be able to do the difficult parts of a paraglider because you have just so many parts which have to be placed in the right order and which have to be connected with one single seam. This picture, by the way, shows a Phantom, which is certainly the most complex paraglider and which takes the most skill to manufacture. Then, um, because we have our own production facility, uh, we can build prototypes quite fast. That, and contrary to most other technical products, like uh, no matter if it's a car or a bike, it's quite easy to build a paragliding prototype. There is if you and it's also not very expensive compared to a serial wing if you have a prototype for a, for a road car it costs i don't know like 10 times or 100 times more than the serial production but for a paraglider the difference is not that big and the production time is also not increased by a lot so when i sent those dxf patterns to the production facility it does not take more than one week and until the glider is finished. When we get the glider, the first prototype, the actual testing phase, the actual testing process starts. Um, one of the very first steps we do with every paraglider is do a lot of pictures because we want to make sure that the design works in terms of not having any unintended deformations. So we, that's uh, I don't know, probably it's not obvious for everybody. This picture uh, was taken by another pilot uh, in flight into the opening of the paraglider. So the green arrows show the profile ribs and this blue arrow shows the top sail and the other one the bottom sail. And so we even take pictures of the internal parts of the paraglider to make sure all, yeah, all parts are tight and the, have the shape we intend them to have.
here you see how this picture I showed you before was taken. So that's in flight and one pilot is head over flying with his camera pointing into the wing. Uh, actually, that's an older camera. The new generations of the GoPro cameras uh, are so good that we don't need to do those kind of flying stunts anymore to get very good pictures of the internals of the glider. Uh, yeah, but we spend a lot of effort on the, the first flights with a new prototype. We try to get as many um, high resolution photos as possible. We uh, try to get every angle of the glider flying at trim speed. We try to do the same at top speed. We try to do the same with the brakes applied. And that's very important because even if the simulation looks good, there are still surprises happening. And it's important for us to find out uh, to find out about those surprises as early as possible. Another aspect which we cover quite early when we get a new prototype are performance comparisons. Because uh, if the performance of a prototype is bad, there is no point in doing many handling tests or many maneuver tests. Uh, it's uh, because the performance is so crucial and often if the performance of a wing is bad, it's very difficult to improve it without building a different design. So what we do, um, the, the, we do those performance tests by flying side by side. We have a glider, it can be our own glider, or it can be also a glider of a competitor's wing. And we try to have calm air, we try to have the exact, exact same wing loading, and we fly side by side and then measure the, try to measure the performance difference. We always do two flights because we switch the wing. The reason for that is that the impact of the harness and of the pilot is very big. So if, even if we use the same harness, a little small difference of the way we sit in the harness can make a huge, perform, a huge difference in performance. That's why when one pilot, when we have two fly pilots flying two wings and doing a performance comparison, we always switch gliders and do the very same again to be sure that we don't make a systematic error because uh, one pilot uh, produces a bit less or a bit more drag than the other one. Those are the performance comparison. And then there are the maneuver tests. A very short video of the ion 6 prototype. And you see of the most important maneuvers. Those are the side collapses. The next maneuver is going to be a frontal collapse. Pilot pulls all A-lines. And the last maneuver is a parachuter stall in the sea risers. The wing is in parachuter stall now. And the test pilot checks if and how quickly the wing exits the parachuter stall. Um, there is a very long list of other maneuvers which are required for the certification test. Uh, it's, I, I don't know by heart, it's, I would say 20 to 30 different maneuver tests, but the most important and most critical tests are certainly the collapse, maybe the spiral dive. Um, what we do internally is 
quite a bit more than what the test houses or what the certification requires for two reasons or we do we do more in two different aspects one aspect is that we deliberately change the trim of the paraglider and see how the reaction to all those maneuvers changes the reason for that is uh, that every paraglider ages and uh, every paraglider uh, changes its trim over time and because there is no there is simply no line existent which has zero shrinking or lengthening over time and before releasing a glider or during the development we try to simulate this aging process so we so we uh, shorten some lines lengthen other lines do those maneuver tests again and try different trim trim setups and line length setup because we want to make sure that the uh, wing is safe with all those uh, different line lengths which have to be expected. Obviously the performance, if we change the trim, uh, the performance might get a bit worse or the handling might get a bit worse or it gets a bit worse, but we want to be sure that the wing is still safe. And another thing um, we do is we uh, make collapses which are bigger than what is required for the certification and here our approach is the same we want to make sure that the wing uh, that the wings reaction does not get drastically worse if you if the collapse happens to be a bit bigger than the certification collapse so yeah, this maneuver test is a, is a huge part of the development process. Uh, and maybe, maybe the biggest part and the most important part are the handling tests. Um, because the handling tests involve flying the paraglider in turbulent air in various conditions and that's the only way to find out about the paraglider's stability it's the only way to find out how the paraglider turns in thermals and how the performance uh, how the paraglider performs in turbulent air um the problem uh, the, the problem with those three aspects with the three aspects i was mentioning which is the handling the safety and the performance is that whenever you improve one aspect there is a big danger that one of the other two aspects got worse so if you improve the handling of a paraglider it can very easily happen that the safety the collapse behavior got worse or if you increase the safety of the per if you increase increase uh, improve the uh, collapse behavior of a paraglider it very often happens that the performance gets worse so all those three aspects handling performance and safety they interact and the the, the, the reason, and that's the reason for the paraglider development being quite complicated because you can't look at those three aspects isolated and you have to be really careful to uh, yeah to, to, to not affect the to not affect any of those parameters in a bad way by improving another one what we do with the handling the way how we improve the handling i was mentioning it before when i talked about the very small sizes uh, the easiest and most efficient way to change the handling characteristic of a paraglider is to change the brake geometry so 
By that I mean we make certain brake lines longer, we make certain brake lines shorter, and this changes the feeling drastically and changes the handling drastically. Um, but obviously there are limits. So if the paragliding, if, if the basic design is bad for the handling, you can't fix everything with the brakes, but by changing the brakes. And usually we don't, or actually we never get our work done by just building one prototype. Even if all the simulations look perfect, we end up finding out that most of the times it's the safety or the handling that is not the way we wanted it to have. Uh, in some cases, it's also the performance, which is worse than what the simulation predicted. And then we have to build another prototype. Um, sometimes we even go back to this very first simulation state, try, uh, try new concepts, simulate them, build another prototype. Uh, yeah, and that's a iterative process. We go through it until we are happy with all those three aspects uh, and until we think the wing is ready to be released and hand it to the test house. That's now and actually, yeah, that's when we think the paraglider is finished. I covered uh, the second and the third part now, so uh, it's time for questions. Good, um, quite interesting to know. One quick question that comes to my mind, uh, people, is you really need to have a good relationship with the person performing the testing as well, because uh, I understand as you, as you grow, the person who is giving you the feedback has to also grow with you because there are certain concepts that you design the paragliders with and they you are really looking for some key answers from them. So how does this relationship work with the with the tester, with the, te with the test pilot? I mean, um, yeah, it's it's absolutely true that the relationship has to be uh, good and the relationship has to be consistent. So, I. If we switch test pilots two times a year, uh, it would be very difficult to develop paragliders because we would not understand each other. I would not understand the feedback of the test pilot. Um, in in our case, I I fly actually every prototype myself, which is which is quite helpful because I have a different view on certain aspects than the test pilot who was not related with the design. But yeah, it's also very important that it's not just me who is flying the wings because I expect certain improvements uh, and want to see certain improvements because they were there in the simulation, for example, and it might be dangerous that I just want them to be true, even if they are not. So it's very good to have a, uh, to have actually other test pilots who are not related to the, uh, who, who are not part of the design process and they have more this external view. But yeah, of course, the communication between designer and test pilots, it, it's quite, it's very crucial. Right. We have uh, now questions coming in from the YouTube Live as well. Before I switch on, I just want to ask one question from YouTube Live. Um, the question is on some models of paragliders, the, the landing rounding degrades after a few years. What internal deformation induced this problem? Maybe they're talking about the ballooning. Does it degrade with time? After a few years, um, we it's quite difficult to detect 
we it, 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 there, there are many aspects i think the i think the the most common aspect of paragliders changing their flight characteristic are the line length uh, because that's what happens very quickly and that's something that has a huge impact and unfortunately it's something uh, which is not always detected even though it's quite easy to detect because it's not yeah it's, it's not too difficult to measure line length to measure the trim of a paraglider but there are still many many old wings flying around where the line length have never been properly checked so and then uh, th th those wings are not flying properly and maybe the pilot thinks it's because the cloth is old or deformed but i think in many cases it's just the line length which could be okay. easily corrected yeah, okay. but of course the cloth also plays a role the most of you probably know that the porosity of a cloth increases over time and which can be easily measured which is a which is a, a standard check being performed but which is a lot more difficult to measure is the the, para, the, the cloth the stretch behavior the elasticity changes um, and that also affects the how the wing flies but from our experience uh, it's it's the, the lines the lines are the most important during the the first few hundred hours of course there is a certain point where the, the there is a certain point where the cloth is not good anymore and <laughs> Okay, so let's move on to the Q&A queue that we have. Um, KK, uh, go ahead, KK. Hello, people. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Uh, people, my question is, uh, you know, I've been intrigued by an interview of uh, Luke Armand, Ozo Narendi, uh, with Ziad, in which he mentions that uh, uh, the gliders in the ENB and ENC category, they tend to go down on sales in two or three years of time. You know, and uh, sometimes you need to give a step up or an evolution model just to, you know, maybe it's just a small step or it's a big step, but sometimes it's towards the sales of a glider. So how would you comment on this? I mean, as an evolution to a previous model, how much is, you know, uh, what is the significant design evolution that we can expect or is it sometimes that you actually give in to the pressure of uh, releasing a new model into the market just to be you know update with the new glider lines uh, it's a, that's a delicate question of course um i mean there there are there are two answers for it there or there are two aspects to that to this question uh, one aspect is obviously uh, that the market demands new gliders every two to three years and we try to fulfill that demand. That's one aspect of the question. And the other aspect of the question is that the uh, the we are progressing from wing generation to wing generation. We are progressing for different reasons. We are progressing because our design know-how gets better. We are progressing because related to that, our simulation possibilities get better. Um, hopefully our, our test team gets better. There uh new materials available i mean not maybe not not every two years but in during during the last five to six years i could name a few examples for cloth which 
at least in, for, for example, very lightweight cloth, which is, was not available before, or very thin and stable lines, which were not there before. So we incrementally improve every year, every, every month, if you want so. But of course, if, we, if the life cycles were five or 10 years, Mm -hmm. Obviously, the, the 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 steps would be bigger, yeah. but yeah. in the end, it's it's up to the customer. Uh, the it's 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 up to the pilots, and the pilots um, seem to be happy and seem to want, uh, like every let's say three years, a new paraglider, and mm -hmm. we put as much and and, and uh, we uh, put as much work in it as possible and improve it as much as possible and if that ever turned out to be not sufficient it the the, the demand of the pilot would be to increase the life cycle of a paraglider uh, okay so i'll just quickly ask you one more thing so when we talk about a pilot who's not flying as much as he could, you know, does it make sense to step up a glider model? Like uh, if I'm flying the Ion 5 for like, you know, two years, maybe just putting 20, 30 hours on it, you know, in a year, does it make sense to step up to Ion 6 or Ion 5 holds good? W what would be your recommendation on that? It's a delicate question. Ah, said, you don't have to answer it. Uh, since my uh, since my job depends on selling gliders, but uh, you can obviously do great flights and be safe and be happy with uh, without upgrading to the newest model whenever it is released. Okay. And there is certainly also a certain value um, on knowing a paraglider very well. So if you just fly a very small amount, if you do a very small amount of flights each year, yeah. uh, I, I personally would not recommend to change your glider every year actually it would be stupid okay. um, it's maybe it's it's like with it's the, the, the answer is maybe related to other project product like if if no matter if it's a mountain bike or a smartphone or a photo camera the the things the things the product do get better and if you're a enthusiast who uh, wants to be absolutely up to date there is always that there is certainly a benefit in having the latest generation because the the the, the wings get lighter the wings handle better the wings get safer you can glide further yeah it's the, it's a it's the same like with i don't know with the, with uh, you answered or so many other products yeah uh, what you say is makes sense. Thank you so much. Welcome. Yeah. Okay. Next um, in line is Navin. Navin Chetri. Navin, go ahead. Yeah. Hello there. Hello. Hello. Uh, my question is regarding the understanding of the aspect ratio. Like, to, is comparing same certification wings from the different manufacturers on the basis of aspect ratio is fair enough what does higher aspect ratio relates to directly like does high aspect ratio means more speed or more glide or it's more dynamic or low means like it's more safe and more solid okay um the aspect ratio is one of the most important parameters to define the demand on the pilot. Uh, one reason is that the more aspect ratio you have, the more difficult the glider is to handle. 
and the more likely very bad things can happen like cravats, horseshoes, whatever. But there are also many other parameters which are important. The aspect ratio is just one very important parameter out of others. So, uh, but because of all those other parameters, it's not possible to say that all paragliders with aspect ratio five are easier to fly that than all paragliders with aspect ratio six. So you can't just look at this one single parameter, but still it's a very decisive one. Um, and the, the, it's also quite decisive for the performance, at least if you want to Im, uh, increase the performance, especially in calm air, the easiest parameter to change is the aspect ratio. So if you increase the aspect ratio, the performance will increase as well. That's, that's yeah, the, the, the easiest way to increase performance. Uh, yeah. Or Yes, with the high performance ratio, it will be like uh, less safe and solid. It will be. Yeah, yeah. But there, but there are obviously limits to that, and it's uh, and even if you look at the competition wings, uh, it's quite proven that aspect ratio ten does not make sense at all. It might make sense in very calm air, but. Uh, it certainly does not make sense in turbulent air. Um, so the it's the, the the rule more aspect ratio leads to more performance uh, is 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 not valid in a very very big range, and it's not valid if you consider the performance in turbulent air because. Uh, because very turbulent air favors less aspect ratio than calm air. So it's always about compromises. Okay, thanks. That's great. And I have a small, one little more question. I Navin, uh, we have others also in the queue. Uh, maybe we can, you can come back later. No problem, no problem. Yeah, thank you, Navin. Yeah. So uh, next question is from Gurpreet. Uh, hi. Um, I have actually two small questions. Uh, one is that when you simulate, can you simulate the line length and the time behavior all, or just the uh, wind performance? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. It was about simulating line length? When you simulate, do you... Uh, 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 the line length behavior is also simulated or uh, just the wing uh, performance? Can you change the line length and see what the effect of different line length would be in simulation? Yes, the, um, it should, the, the lines and accordingly the line length are part of the simulation. Uh, if uh, if I go back to the, ah, okay. It, uh, a slide I showed before uh, included the lines. So yeah, the, the answer to your question is. No, yes. what I mean is the pendulum behavior. You know, if to increase the line length, the centrifugal forces and the pendulum forces, they are different. Not just the, the curvature, I'm talking about the pendulum behavior also. That's also calculated. Um, you, uh, you mean if we change the line length during the simulation? Yeah, I mean basically yes. We we try we, we simulate different trim settings, and therefore, and that means we simulate the behavior. Uh, yeah, we simulate the reaction to different line length. Okay. Um, the second question is. Uh, uh, that you obviously design uh, a glider like a low B, uh, you design with the normal harness, a sit-up harness in mind. And perhaps if the pilot changes to a pod harness on a glider that you didn't intend for a pod harness. 
Um, the, that's a good question. Uh, and my answer to it is that the difference is smaller than you might think because there are, if you, if you increase the drag of the harness, there are two things happening. The one thing that happens if you have, uh, you have the wing and the harness, which is my fist, if you increase the drag, the wing will move forward. So this effect would actually decrease the aspect ratio. But there is a second effect, and this increases the aspect ratio. And the second effect uh, is caused by the increased drag. Whenever you increase the drag, the glide ratio gets worse. Uh, so you have those when you increase the uh, when you increase the drag of the harness, you have two counteracting effects which work against each other and which lead to the fact that the angle of attack is not changed that much. Uh, and you see that. Uh, do do you know the uh, do you know the costume flights in San Hilaire, where the where the people uh, uh, have huge yeah. whatever dragons planes yeah. attached to the harness? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. there you see those two counteracting effects very well you visually see that the performance is very bad. So the, the wing does not fly straight like before, but the wing goes whoop, down like that. And, yeah. and that, and this, and if you just look at this effect, the angle of attack increases. And you might think that it's dangerous because the wing is close to stall because the angle of attack increases so much. But luckily there is this other effect that the uh, big drag pulls and this decreases the angle of attack. And so you have these two effects which almost cancel each other out. Uh, and so changing the drag of the harness, it obviously, it obviously the, the harness drag has a big impact on the performance. That's huge, but the the angle of attack is not significantly changed, and therefore the perfect trim of a paraglider has not to be changed drastically if you fly a super pot harness or a, in terms of drag very bad upright harness. All right, thank you. You're welcome. I hope it was uh, understandable. Yeah, thank you. It was. Thank you. Uh, hey, people. Hey. Uh, back again. Uh, I was uh, trying to know about uh, the evolution in wings. And as I see, uh, so many things have changed over the last uh, decade or so, like the weight of paragliders have gone, has gone down. The construction has improved and improvised so much. Uh, then again, uh, many efficiency factors have been done in. But one thing I have observed has remained pretty much constant throughout this is the weight range of uh, almost all the uh, all the sizes of uh, any particular glider. So any uh, attention is being brought to this. Uh, my sense of thinking is if uh, if the weight range was increased uh, just a tad little bit, like if it was made from 20, that is the range, if it was uh, uh, possible to make it 30, then you would have better overlap and perhaps uh, one size less, which could mean maybe more standard gliders or you know, uh, maybe uh, slightly cheaper affordable wings. Um, any any yeah, effort in those directions? Thank you. Cool. Um, there is, I think there is no perfect solutions, but there is no perfect solution to this. And you already named the two aspects you have to uh, in in the, the one scenario you have very very you have a lot of different sizes and the perfect weight range for everybody 
but you need too many wings. It doesn't make sense for us. And in the other scenario with the uh, with a very big weight range, uh, maybe with only two different sizes, um, you will end up having many pilots who just can't find a good wing loading. And yeah, that's why we that's why we ended up with uh, five sizes and this 20 kilogram weight range uh, and this 10 kilogram overlap for most wings. Uh, it's th there are there are arguments uh, for what you proposed, and there are arguments for making even more sizes. Yeah, we tried to find the best compromise in having a reasonable uh, to to have a reasonable amount of choice for the pilot to find the correct weight range and also to not have ten sizes. Uh, my question uh, actually arose from uh, you know looking at a uh, few designs from Advance, uh, particularly in the low uh, low range, in which they have some extended weight range, which enables uh, you know a good uh, envelope of uh, flying range, and uh, they seem pretty pretty planted uh, throughout the range, uh, which is why uh, the direction of my question was: uh, mm -hmm. Is this uh, being given uh, thought to uh, in other uh, OEMs, especially Nova? Just yes. That. Yeah. Yeah. We have. We have thought about it that it's, it's quite difficult to communicate this weight range uh, issue properly with the pilots uh, because um, th there, is this, there is this rule of thumb uh, that every wing has to be flown on top of its weight range. I don't think, and it's also, and it's, uh, it's kind of handled like it was a, a, a law of physics. But actually, the 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 the, the weight ranges we come up with are quite. We set them deliberately. We could, when we certify a wing with 100 kilogram top range. In most cases, we could just as well say the top range is 95 or 105 kilo. It would pass the certification just as well. So it's a very, it's a very, it's not derived from any laws of physics. It's just what we think makes sense for flying. Uh, and with those extended weight ranges, we have, uh, we've tried that a longer time ago and we had the experience that it's very difficult to properly communicate to the pilot because because of this belief that every wing has to be flown on top of its weight range so yeah it's 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 quite difficult and if you and with this extended weight range then you have a uh, people who complain that the wing does not climb very well in weak thermals uh, because they just always go for the top of the weight range. So, Understood. Thank yeah. you. It's, Thank it's, you for the insights. Yeah. yeah. You want to have a sip of water, people? <laughs> I'm fine, thanks. <laughs> good. Uh, that's good to hear. Uh, next question is from uh, Wiz. Yeah, Wiz, go ahead. Uh, hi, Philip. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Uh, okay, so my question is also about the weight range. Uh, when you do your testing, uh, typically the, t the pilot is flying in the middle of the weight range or, uh, you know, what is the NOVA philosophy, which is the best uh, weight to be on your, on your mm -hmm. glider? Um, I... I think that there are there are two aspects to this question. Uh, one, two aspects to the question uh, for the perfect weight wing loading or weight range. One aspect is that it really depends on your personal likings. From my, some people are used to flying at a high weight range at a high wing loading, and they simply like it because it, uh, it suits their personal likings, nothing else. 
and other pilots are used to flying at a low weight range, uh, at, at a low wing loading, and and they like it because they like this rather slow and gentle moving from through the air, whereas other pilots like a maximum of dynamics and speed and that's nothing else but a matter of what people personally prefer and there's no right or wrong to that that's just about what you liked or what you are used to and uh, the second aspect uh, depends on the conditions you fly in obviously so uh, some people avoid strong thermals and they avoid high winds and that obviously favors flying with uh, low wing loading and people who do the opposite uh, should rather go for the top end but that's uh, yeah that, that's uh, that that's kind of common sense but the first aspect is often not covered and when people are not sure about what size they shall choose what i always advise them to do is look at the wing they are currently flying look at the projected surface of their current wing and calculate the wing loading so which is uh, which is simply done by uh dividing the uh, overall takeoff weight by the projected surface. It's important to divide it by the projected surface, not by the flat surface. And uh, then uh, you end up having a certain number, let's say four kilograms takeoff weight per square meter projected area. Uh, and if you are happy on your current wing with those four kilogram per square meter projected area, it makes sense to target that same aspect ratio again on your new wing. That's what I advise people. There is an exception to the rule, and that is you have to consider the aspect ratio. The higher the aspect ratio of a glider is, the higher the wing loading has to be for several reasons. But if you compare two wings with similar aspect ratio, uh, it and if you find out that you like a certain wing loading on one wing it makes sense to aim for a similar wing loading on the other glider or for a similar projected surface basically um okay i get that the question was that when you were uh, when you are testing do you oh, yeah. uh, the, uh, is it ideally in the center or towards the top uh depends on uh we use ballast quite frequently to and different harnesses to be able to change the wing loading uh, and it depends on what we test if we do the if we do the certification maneuver tests we mainly do that on the very top of the weight range because it's most that's where the most critical things happen maybe if a wing is uh, if a wing uh, performs all those maneuvers properly on top of the weight range you maybe need uh, one or two or a few flights on bottom of the weight range to be sure but usually there are no surprises and the and also with the handling tests we try to cover a bigger weight range we don't fly too much in the lower half of the weight range simply because we know that our pilots usually don't do that and that's why we don't put too much effort in uh, optimizing the handling for the um, for the lower half of the weight range but we, yeah, but anywhere from the middle of the weight range to the top of the weight range. We want our wings to fly very well in that whole range. 
and that the, the, the real bottom of the weight range uh, still makes sense for some pilots who really, really like to fly rather slow, rather gentle. Chris, does it answer your question? We can go ahead. Yes. Do, uh, do we have time for another quick question? Maybe at the end, Wiz. Okay, we All have right. a long queue. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, okay, Nikhil, go ahead. We take your question now. Okay. Hi, Kirill. Um Hi. So my question is about: Could you could you brief about is there a relationship between a particular glider and a particular harness? Because sometimes the dealers tend to um, tell people that, okay, this glider flies better with this harness. So usually if it's a exoseat, it goes better with ozone glider. If it's Woody Valley, it's, it flies good with most other brands. Is there any, is this really true? Because in the design equation, it's, it's just two points that are hanging underneath a glider. And uh, it wasn't part of the Nikhil, design. Understood, understood your question. Yeah, we can go ahead. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um... For for sure, there is a temptation uh, to for that argument for only marketing reasons. Um, so yeah, uh, obviously, it's certain brands tend to recommend their harnesses for their wings, but uh, but that's just but that's just one part of the question and. Uh, the harness is actually quite a bit more than just two points being connected. I mean, it's true. The, the, the connection is only two points, obviously. But uh, it's, there, are, there are harnesses uh, which are very stable. In, yeah, exactly. In, uh, which are very roll stable. And there are harnesses which are not roll stable at all. And these characteristics, and, and the same is valid for the same is valid for paragliders. There are, and it, this is there are certain design parameters which lead to paragliders doing that a lot or being very damned in that regard. So, uh, yeah, and uh, and this sums up. So if you have a if you have a paraglider which likes to shift the the risers a lot like this in turbulent air. And if you have a harness that allows this motion, um, the, yeah, it, it, it simply adds up and the other way around. So, uh, yeah, so those are not, those can't be treated independently. And um, another argument, for flying the uh, harnesses from the same brand is simply, it's not just marketing. In, in most of the cases, the test teams uh, will use their in-house harnesses for large parts of the testing. So, and so there is a point, uh, when you say it's optimized for a certain harness. If, uh, yeah, if, uh, if a harness from a certain manufacturer it does this movement a lot, uh, the design team of the gliders will maybe look for a glider which is a bit more damped in this regard because otherwise it would be too lively. So it, I mean, the, the, it would make sense to fly the same harnesses maybe as the development teams do. But uh, if the development team does, does fly non-in-house harnesses, you, they won't tell you. So the, uh, So that's why the best guess is to fly in-house harnesses, but uh, it's but I, I I think beside this role stability, there is the, the, there is nothing else. So if Got you have a, 
if you have a harness from one manufacturer and one from another manufacturer and they are similar in terms of this roll stability from my point of view there is no other secret parameter on the harness which might lead to one harness being suited better got it got it that answers my question thank you yeah. you're welcome and it's again a, it's it's again a, also a question of personal likings some some people like a high amount of damping from the harness and some like a low amount of damping so i i, I don't think it should be a hard rule to go for the uh, to go for the harness from the same manufacturer it will suit many pilots but it will also there will be many pilots who will be happier if they don't fly harness and wing from the same manufacturer got it that answers my question thank you okay uh, next question is from mangesh uh, hi philip uh, there has been a lot of development in the uh, double skin glider then single skin glider came up and uh, now there is a new design by apco which is hybrid which is one and a half skin the a and b are double skin and the rest of the glider is single so do you see any design changes or any further development in this hybrid design of paragliders um i mean those those hybrid solutions the the question with those hybrid solutions is if they combine more of the advantages of both worlds or if they combine more of the disadvantages of both worlds um i personally don't find those hybrid concepts too tempting uh because the the, the single skin uh, gliders have the, the major strength of the single skin gliders is their super low weight uh, and if you take away that advantage the very easy take off behavior in low winds is the only thing which remains so i i don't see too many advan advantages for those hybrid gliders remaining because they are they are they are not super light anymore and they still have a lot of the disadvantages of the single skin gliders which is uh, not so good performance not so good flare behavior you have a uh, lots of lines which uh, uh, which make the handling and the sorting of the line a bit more difficult. Yeah, but it depends on what you use it for. Uh, uh, yeah, we will, we will, uh, like with all new stuff, we will find out if uh, it's something we are going to see a lot in five years or if it's something we won't see a lot in five years. M my guess is that we. Uh, we won't see too much of it in five years because I think the it combines a bit more of the disadvantages of both worlds than the advantages. That's my my opinion. Okay, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, next question is from Rexon. Hi, hi, Philip. Uh, my hi. question is: is, uh, is there any difference between the Dominica fabric and the Porcher fabric? Is there any uh, relation between performance or life of the wing if we use Dominica or uh, Porcher? What is your thought? Um, there are there are many differences, but um, it depends on the particular cloth type you are looking at if you um because yeah the dominico and uh, porsche has many different cloth and if you compare let's let's say if we if we made weight ranges uh, one weight range from uh, 
25 to 30 gram per square meter, one weight range from 30 to 35 gram per square meter, and another one above. Uh, the, my answer to this question would be quite different uh, depending on what weight range we are looking at. If you look, if we look at the lower end of the weight range, so 25 to 30 gram, obviously the very lightest um, cloth is made by Dominico. That's not a that's not a question of of my personal opinion. That's that's just the way it is. Um, and this very light Dominico cloth is also very very good in terms of porosity and uv resistance it's a bit more difficult to sew than the very light porsche cloth this is also something which uh, we as a manufacturer has to have to take in account uh, there are certain cloth which can be manufactured more precise than others uh, the softer the softer cloth is, the the more difficult is it is to manufacture. In the end, you will have a we will end up having more wrinkles than with the other cloth. Um, but I would still say that if you go for a super light glider, uh, what Dominico offers is a bit superior to what Porsche offers in that regard. But if you look at other parts of the gliders, for example, the rips, I would tend to say the opposite. There are just so many, there are so many different, it's not, it's not just those weight ranges, it's also the parts of the glider. You, I don't know how many of you are aware of that the, for the internal parts, of the glider you you use a different kind of cloth which has a different kind of uh, coating than uh, the cloth you use for top and bottom sail and again for those internal parts you have uh, different weight ranges so we actually it's not just three different weight ranges we have it's those different weight ranges for internal parts for top and bottom sail cloth so and each of those segments or almost each of those segments for all of those segments porsche and dominico offers cloth and yeah and if i had to compare them my my uh, verdict would be quite different in some cases we think that dominico is superior in other cases we think that porsche is superior but there is no, but there is no thing like saying uh, all Domenico cloth are better or worse in terms of ripping strength after certain amount of UV radiation. I think that there is not one single thing which is better on all Porsche or on all Domenico cloth. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome. Ashutosh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, hi, Philip. Uh, thank you for your talk. I have a few questions which are actually related to each other. And it's possible that I'll tell them, I'll ask the questions so that you can possibly answer it as a, in a wholesome way. In regards, yeah. in regards, it's with regards to changing certain parameters of the wing in order to see the difference on the performance, uh, the behavior, and the handling of the paraglider. So the, the three or four factors which I'm keen on knowing about is, what is the effect on the paraglider performance behavior and handling when you change the line length, when you change the curvature, which changes the projected aspect ratio, what happens when you change the inlet size on the intake? You see a lot of sharp nose intakes, some are big inlets, some are very small slit like in, inlets. Mm -hmm. And the last part of the question is, I've seen some paragliders with uh, elliptical, uh, you know, uh, edges on the, you know, on the tips, and some have a mild sweep back and a straight, straight back end. Mm -hmm. the, it's possible the 
can you explain the, this part of the design so that maybe they're all related to each other? I, yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. I, I will. I, I will try to. Yeah. The the first two are the first two were the line length and the curvature. Yes. Um, they are kind of related to each other. Um, if you have a if you have a certain paraglider, and if you simply reduce the line length. Um, what will happen? What will happen is uh, I don't know if it works. Uh, I will try to. I will try to make a sketch. Okay. Uh, I I understand. So, so if you have a. Uh, those are two paragliders. This one has a very long lines. This one has very short lines. What you can uh, obviously see here that yeah, this angle here changes. So the one with the 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 one with the very short lines uh, will tend to lose wingspan. It will have a very bad uh, the it will the it will not be very stable because and one way um, one way to make it more stable is increase the curvature if you increase the curvature you will have the uh, like I showed before you will have the the wing tip pulling here and the other one pulling here and uh, you, you will regain some of the stability you lost. Um, so uh, line length and curvature can't be discussed separately, but if we tried to discuss it separately, if, um, if, you, if you shorten the line length, um, what happens is that the, if you imagine the, the uh, the pendulum, uh, the, the, the shorter the line length, uh, the quicker the quicker the pendulum. If you have a very long pendulum, it will go like this. And the, 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 the shorter it is, the quicker it will be. So uh, short line length leads to higher agility. The wing turns quicker. And you don't have you don't have this pendulum delay. If you have very long lines and you want to change from left turn to right turn, you have to wait a long time till the wing goes from there and to there. And if you have very short lines, it goes goes it goes very quickly. So it will be more agile. Um, this is an advantage for handling, but it is, an, it is a disadvantage for certain maneuvers like collapse behavior shooting. If you have super short lines, it's easier for the wing to shoot forward. So if you have very short lines, you have to, you will end up having more problems with the, with the shooting behavior after collapses. Um, yeah, that's the, and the, the effect of the line length. If you, the, and the effect of the curvature is mainly related to the, to the roll behavior. So if you, have a, if you have a very low curvature, like if you have a very flat glider, the, that will lead to a lot of stability. So the, a very a ring with low curvature does not want to do this roll movement. If you have a very cu high curvature, it will like to roll a lot. So um, again, there, there is a there is a sweet spot. If the if the curvature is too high, then uh, the glider will fly like this all the time. And if it's too low, it's going to be difficult to do turns because it's just too stable. Um, it also affects the aspect ratio because the projected aspect yeah. ratio is changing. So, how how, how does that uh, how does that affect the, the way the data performs after that? 
it's that, I, I have uh, a the, big, the, sorry go ahead please the if you if you decrease the curvature uh you will have more projected aspect ratio and you have will have more projected surface this uh, if you look at it uh, if you look at it one dimensional uh, it will increase your performance obviously because but uh, there is no there is no advantage without the downside and the the downside is that you lose that you lose spanwise tension because like i said before if you have the a high curvature you have the wingtips pulling uh oh, pulling in a spanwise direction exactly and this helps to reduce the ballooning for example of the glider and if you have little ballooning it helps the performance so little ballooning means a lot of performance so uh in if you look at it from that way uh high curvature is helpful for having good performance because it makes the wing cleaner Right. But and does the curvature also have an effect on reinflation in case of in case of a bent tip? The curvature, um, in case of a collapse. Yes. Um, yes, yes, because um, usually the usually uh, the more projected aspect ratio is better usually. Okay. Yeah. And then the the openings. Yes. The, the in uh, in uh, in straight flight there is not too much difference because uh, because in straight flight there is no circulation. There there is very little airflow uh, inside the inside the wing. So. It, it doesn't change a lot if the openings are big or if they are small but obviously if the openings are small it's the wing does not deflate so much and it also takes longer to inflate so the the and it also affects the brake pressure if you have very big if you have very big openings if you hit the brakes suddenly you force air going outside through the openings and if you have very small openings and if you do this on the brakes it's difficult for the air to go outside the wing and therefore if you have small openings it will you have more brake pressure and if you have big openings uh, it will lead to less brake pressure uh, and obviously it also affects uh, the reopening if if the wing deflates after a collapse if the openings are big uh it will inflate quicker than if they are very small yeah okay. and the position of the inlet on the leading edge uh on the position of the inlet yeah going high, i've seen some sharp nose where the position is actually facing down and some have it a little higher up yeah on the, leading um, edge. the 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 contrary to i think what many pilots think uh, the the shark nose or the, the the advantage of the openings being far back is not that the internal pressure is very high the advantage is that it stays quite constant even if you change the angle of attack and so it's and and actually the it's not most important to have a very high internal pressure it makes sense to uh, it makes sense to have a constant internal pressure uh, when you change the angle of attack and there are different ways there are there are different ways and different shapes to to achieve that but in general i think it's quite obvious that the, the further you move in front the higher the internal pressure because you are closer to that stagnation point and if, if you move further back the internal pressure will decrease but um, with the potential benefit of being more constant 
when you change the angle of attack. Okay. Thanks a ton. That was a lot of information. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Asatosh. Um, okay, let's. Uh, how are you doing, people? Should we take more questions or should we? I, 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 I'm fine. I, I will <laughs> tell you when I'm not anymore. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let's go ahead then. Uh, Vijay, go ahead with your question then. Hi, people. <clears throat> Hi. 2010, there was a big revolution in paragliding design when the two liners are introduced in the competition mm -hmm. wings. And 2011, there were many incidents. Then many manufacturers step out of the designing of the two liners. Only few continue. If you see last couple of years, all the manufacturers come into designing two liners. But I don't see Nova yet into the two liners. Why? Uh, no, the, the, the last part of the question is why you don't see a Nova wing uh, yeah. among two liners. Yes. Um, the the reason for that is I I I totally agree with your uh, with your perception there, and I agree that the two liners have turned out to be uh, not dangerous but manageable for very good pilots. Um, Nova left the 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 reason that we have. Uh, haven't started with two liners early is that we were not in we did we, we stopped competing in with the PW uh, in the PWC uh, many years ago that was back then when those were only prototypes and uh, like Formula One maybe today and it was a huge effort for manufacturers to uh, compete there without too much benefit for serial gliders. Uh, and that's still the case to a certain extent. Every manufacturer has only a certain uh, amount of R&D resources. And you have to choose where to invest those resources. And uh, our, our focus is certainly on the lower aspect ratio three liners. But we have been building a few uh, two liner prototypes. Uh, and we said we, I, I don't think we are aiming to. Uh, hit the competition scene, but we are aiming to be up to date with that with the technology that comes with two liners, and it might some might be something we are going to see in sea gliders in the future, and we certainly wanna be ready for it, and we are continuing to build two liner protos even if there is no serial ring available right now or in the very near future. But I think sooner or later there will be a Nova 2 liner available, certainly when two liners hit the ENC class. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, Rakesh, you go ahead next. Hi, people. Hi. Uh, my, the thing I want uh, to ask you is, can you explain the functionality of sea riser controls, uh, especially in the new age sea gliders, and uh, their efficiency and the linearity of the pressure, uh, how efficient and uh, how good they are uh, compared to uh, the old age sea gliders? The, um, uh, the, the, the question was uh, my take on sea riser control. Um, no, uh, let me ask it uh, again or, or I'll try and simplify. Uh, can, uh, to begin with, can you explain the functionality of sea risers? 
in new age sea gliders? Uh, in, I mean, the, I, I think the, uh, if we talk about rear riser steering, the, the, the best wings for rear riser steering are obviously two liners. Because, the, because what you basically want to do when you fly with the rear riser, you use it mainly if you fly uh, at speed in accelerated flight and what you actually want to do is you want to inverse what the speed system does and this is only possible with two liners uh, what happens uh, what happens with three liners is you distort the airfoil in a way that is not beneficial so i will try to do another drawing uh, what you do with Uh, with uh, with three liners, when you pull the C, you distort the airfoil in a way which is not beneficial for the performance. So the 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 most elegant uh, or the yeah uh, the the rear riser control works the best for two liners. Um, for C liners. Uh, it's uh, for three liners. I think it still makes sense to use it, but you have to be aware that it's just not as good as on two liners. On two liners, there is no downside in terms of performance. You do don't lose any performance if you pull the B, the rear risers, because you don't distort the airfoil. And on uh, and on three liners, I think, yeah, and three liners, you have to be aware to not use it like crazy, because if you if you pull, you have to use it gently, just maybe to just to to stop some pitch movement or to do some steering. It's certainly a lot better than to use the brake. Uh, I, I don't advise to use the brake when flying at speed. It's better to use the sea risers. But on three liners, and I would say in all three liners, you have to be aware that if you just pull the sea, uh, you distort the airfoil in a bad ways way. So what works on a B line on a two liner is really doing working a lot. On the rear riser, I don't think it's to be recommended on a three liner. So yeah, you have to be more careful. Thank you. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, next question is from Naveen. He's come back now. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi. My question is regarding like uh, Last few years we have. Naveen, we lost. Uh, yeah. Hello. Uh, come Is again with your question. Yeah. Yeah. E e N A plus. Are there huge differences between E N A and E N plus in the terms of performance and the safety? That's my question. Uh, it was interrupted. The difference in between E N what? E N A and E N A plus. Actually, from last few years we are hearing a new category like E N A plus. Yeah. Ah, okay. Now I I got it. Um, the the answer to the question is um, similar than to my, my previous answer to the question of uh, low B and high B gliders. It's where I said that the EMB range is very big in terms of what the certification allows within this class. The same is valid for ENA. You can build a lot of different concepts which are within ENA. And um, this ENA plus class is something rather new because in the past ENA gliders were always designed 
with uh, NAE or even with the focus on the school use. And so, and if you focus on the school use, the glider will just be very different than if you focus on the pilots who use it after the school. Because uh, a school glider uh, has to, I mean, from, from being more robust for being suited from the, for the training hill to in the, in the school for a school glider performance is obviously not an issue because the, yeah, the, the, the school and the training of the pilots does not benefit from, uh, from high performance. So that's why on classic ENA wings, the focus is not so much on performance and on this, if you, what you call A plus wings, uh, the, we did not have to make any compromise, that there are no compromise needed to fulfill those school demands. And so, yes, the difference in performance is quite big. Maybe even bigger than the average difference in performance between low B and high B. That's at least the case for, for, for our A plus wing. It's for the Ionic, it's performance wise, it's closer to the low B ion than to the ENA prion. Okay, that helps a lot. So ENA can ENA plus can be a big thing in like next few years too, because mostly pilots will move on from direct after school, they go to low B. Now they have one more option, ENA plus. So yes, it, it can be a big, big thing. I, I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Okay. So we have now the last question in the queue from Anika. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, hi. Am I audible? Yes, Anika, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So first, I'm really thankful for the opportunity. And uh, my question is really generalized. It's not a technical one. So how did you uh, get into this field, like professionally? Uh, what was the standard criteria that you had to meet to, you know, be a part of the team? Um, how I got into this profession, uh, I, I think Alok covered it a little bit with uh, his introduction. Um, so yeah, I've, I have uh, always interested, I've always been interested in flying and I have always been interested in, uh, in science. Uh, and so my, my education was uh, studying mechanical engineering, which is not specifically related to flying, but which is a very general uh, engineering education. Uh, yeah, and so it was a, a mix of my general interests, of my actual flying and of my technical education that led me there. But if you, yeah, if you look at other designers, uh, that's certainly a combination which is not very rare, but there are also other approaches. There are, oh, I have to close the window, sorry. Um, there are designers uh, without a scientific technical education which are successful. So, yeah, there are obviously different approaches. I mean, there is no specific, there are just so few designers in the whole world, there is no specific education for designing paragliders. But yeah, I, I think it makes sense to have a combination of uh, technical education and yeah, the interest in flying. Okay, so yeah, that was my question that after your uh, primary education, what did you do? But as you're saying that, you mean that there is no specific course after mechanical engineering to get into uh, design? No, not, not at all. I mean, probably, the, probably the, the, the closest would be some aeronautical engineering 
because that covers aerodynamics, but still, like I said before, the, the uh, paragliders are quite different than most other more rigid aircraft. So no, there is, there is nothing specific. The paragliding world is just way too small for a more specific education to establish. Okay, I got it. Okay, thanks, Anika. Uh, next question is from KK. KK, go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi again, people. Uh, people, we've been observing an attempt. Uh, uh, I'll just cite an example as in flow fusion. You know, they're trying to make a hybrid of a two liner and a three liner concept. So uh, do you think in the near future, there is a possibility where uh, we can make uh, pure two-liner ENCs? Are we working anywhere uh, close towards that direction? Um, that is um, mainly actually a question of the certification standards. Because uh, uh, the, I would not say the only way, but more or less the only way to certify two liners uh, with so-called collapse lines. Um, I, I won't go too much into detail because it would take too long, but right now those collapse lines are restricted to END paragliders, which practically means that uh, two liners can only be certified with an END rating. But this is about to be changed. Uh, it's a very complicated process to change the European norm. So at least I don't know when this is going to happen, if it's more a matter of months or years, I really don't know. But I think it's something going to happen. And if and after this has changed, it's going to and we will very quickly see two liners in the ENC class. It's really just a matter of the it's really just a matter of the certification criteria. Yeah. Okay. And uh, one more quick question. I was discussing this with Ziad, and uh, Ziad Basil kind of suggested that I should be asking you this question. Uh, how much difference, uh, you know, in the you know, uh, how wild can collapses go good or bad uh, uh, when we are using uh, collapse lines and, uh, you know, uh, you know, a glider passed with collapse lines and how the same collapse would behave uh, in real life? You know, what would be the percentage of difference? Um, it's a, it's a very, it's a very diff, uh, difficult question that, uh, would require a very, very long answer. And there are, it's, it's even, a, I, I, had a, I had a very interesting uh, dis discussion with the, also on R&D team about it. Uh, I, I think there are some, uh, the, 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 there are upsides and downsides of the collapse lines. I think one our experience with uh, with with collapse lines is that it makes the certification a lot easier. Um, so when we usually to usually to make a collapse work, uh, which is induced with the A risers, what we do is change the actual paraglider design to improve the collapse behavior of this induced collapse. What uh, you can do with the collapse lines, if you're using collapse lines, collapse lines are basically, for those who don't know, uh, collapse lines are lines which are attached in front, sometimes quite far in front of the A line attachments. And it's like a separate riser, which is a separate line level which is completely loose in normal flight and it only gets loaded when you pull it um, <clears throat> and now and our experience is with the two liner protos for example we had 
that with those col you don't to, to pass the to pass the collapse tests you do not so much change the wing itself but you change the collapse lines so the without the collapse lines i strongly believe that the effort that goes into improving the collapse behavior is beneficial for the wing and with the collapse lines that's obviously not the case because the collapse lines are not even part of the serial glider so what we do with the collapse lines is uh, we change the collapse lines until we like the collapse that's my that's the downside of the collapse lines on the on the other hand like i said before uh two liners at, at least some of them have turned out to be absolutely manageable and safe in real flight in real air in turbulent air and uh, the only way to collapse to to make them pass the certification is collapse lines so it's, it's kind of a dilemma there are obviously safe gliders like those uh, certain two liners that can only be certified with collapse lines yes. and that's certainly an argument for allowing the collapse lines because if they weren't it would prevent those good gliders from being flowing on the other hand uh, collapse lines make it a lot easier with collapse lines it's a lot easier to certify wings to certify any wing which is absolutely not necessarily safe in real life so and that's an argument to not have the collapse lines allowed and the solution until now is to restrict those collapse lines to END only but it's a very it's a very difficult question in the end i think with collapse lines um the with collapse lines you can uh, certify the, i will not say everything but you can you can certify a lot of gliders some of them being very good and safe in real life and some of them being not good without collapse lines uh you can without collapse lines you're more restricted to certain designs uh but i don't think there is a uh, yeah I, I i don't have a final answer to the collapse line question because there are just very good arguments for them and i think good arguments against them and that gives a lot of perspective uh, into what i ask definitely helps cool. thank you so much yeah padriya yeah. yeah hi philip thank you so much for giving such inside out knowledge in detail and uh, thank you so much for answering so patiently for the last uh, about one hour each every each and every question and uh, here i go with my question which is not really serious a little bit on a funny side so when uh, when is nova is moving their manufacturing to india because after corona virus india seems to be more promising country it's quite if you help uh, it, it's quite it's quite difficult to set up a production site um if you if if you help us setting up the production site we are certainly interested yeah we have many many engineers enthusiastic here you can already see that and uh, i'm sure that you know uh, government will help and they they are preparing I, i hope it will happen and we see noah here soon thank you so much you welcome have a nice day all great i think we are done with the queue uh, no other questions people uh, it was a great session honestly cool. we learned a lot the whole community learned a lot right. um 
and uh, towards closing do you want to say something people before i let everyone in and thank you um i i haven't prepared any okay. final <laughs> words so, <laughs> yeah it was it was uh, it was interesting for me as well and i think it was the first time it was the first time i ever did something like that but uh, it's something that should be repeated i think because it's it's very efficient and it's interesting and for me it's also and for me it's also interesting to get an impression of the perspective of the pilots and not just uh, walking around uh, inside the Nova factory and hearing the opinions in our in this bubble yeah what I was really surprised today, there was not even a single phantom question. I thought there will be phantom questions today. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. True, yeah, you were wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I was wrong there, yeah. Um, but clearly, uh, a great session for all of us. We learned a lot in this session. Uh, I invite everyone now, come ahead and thank people. Yeah. Sripa, thank you so much. Thank, it's a lovely session. Thank you. Thank you, so thank much, you. Thank you Alok. Bye bye. Session, God bless. People. Thank you, Alok. Thank you for the story. Thank you, Alok. Thank you, Alok. Thank you, Alok. Thank you, Alok. Thank you, Thank you, Alok. 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 Thank you, 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 Thank you,